Jan is a full professor uh, for Intelligent Autonomous Systems at Computer Science Department of TU Darmstadt. Jan has studied a number of areas uh, of computer science, electrical engineering, mechanical and control engineering at TU Munich, Fern Uni Hagen at Germany, at National University of Singapore, and University of Southern California. Interestingly, he received four master's degrees in these disciplines, as well as a PhD in CS from USC. Jan has been performing research uh, at a number of institutions, such as Germany, uh, at DLR in Germany, TU Munich, and Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics. Uh, and in Japan, at Advanced Te Telecommunication Research Center, ATR, at USC, and at both NUS and Siemens Advanced Engineering Center in Singapore. He has led multiple research groups in machine learning for robotics at institutions such as Max Planck Institute and Intelligent Systems. It is no surprise that Jan is among a leading luminary in the field and he has received multiple prizes such as the Dick Wolt Best Prize for a PhD in US, uh, a Thesis Runner-Up Award in 2007, uh, the RSS Earlier Career Spotlight, the INNS Young Investigator Award, IEEE RAS Early Career Award and numerous Best Paper Awards. In 2015, he received the ERC Starting Grant, which is one of the most prestigious early career grants in Europe. In 2019, he was appointed the IEEE Fellow, and in 2020, an Ellis Fellow and Ellis Program Director. And I think one of the more interesting tidbits about the work and the impact that Jan has had is not the number of papers. I think often people say that uh, the legacy of faculty is not papers, but, but at students. And Jan <laughs> has been particularly successful at that. He's been a faculty at U Darmstadt relatively short time, but he has already nurtured a very large set of uh, outstanding young researchers who are now faculty at leading universities in USA, Japan, Germany, Finland, Holland, and postdoc scholars at CS departments across MIT, CMU, Berkeley, and, and basically the leaders at, uh, at all walks of field. Anywhere you go, you will find a footprint that Jan is leaving. Uh, and he has a particular school of thought that I am particularly very fond of, and, and today, I'm, I'm glad that I get to host you. So over to you. Thank you, Jan. Thanks so much for your kind introduction. Um, I'm starting to blush. Um, luck luckily, my room is so dark that you guys don't see that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to talk today about well, robot learning quo vadis. And that's really a big, become a big question for me since, um, well, um, we all, well, let's get into the talk and you'll see why this is such a big question for me. Let's maybe start first about the depressing part about robotics. What you see here is actually the first robot commercial ever made. In 1960s, the manuf robot manufacturer Unimate was so full of themselves, so cocky that they said, we are going to put a robot into every home. Now, that was before the PC. That we would that robotics already promised we're going to put a robot into everybody's home. Now you'll see in a moment that you will never would want never want to have this monster in your home, but at the same time, dream was there, and the way they engineered it and staged it is actually was not so different when you think about it from how we stage things today in industrial robotics. Since basically, well, what did they do? Well, they created a couple of desired trajectories, they placed the objects very precisely, and well, they used uh, well a mixture of gravity compensation and PD control in order to make this robot execute these trajectories pretty much perfectly. Fine, most of these things were done in, in analog electronics, and there was a very, very a tiny digital computer only in it. And um, we have moved tremendously in terms of beautiful hardware, in terms of um, much better compute, much more sensing. And in theory, we should be, well, have solved this problem for a long time. I mean, after all, we got the PC in the meantime, and by now everybody has more compute power in their iPhone than in the biggest supercomputer that they had back then. And it's amazing when you look at this video, you recognize how anachronistic it is. You, know, you have the housewife drinking champagne at home while the husband goes to work. I mean, 
where did, that doesn't even exist anymore for that scenario. Everybody is a little bit ashamed to see this, that this existed in the past. Um, and well, well, let's go, let's, let's go forward. It really ends with a champagne at home. And as roboticists, we should be ashamed, especially about the big question of why don't we have such robots today? And well, the obvious next question is, well, where have robots been successful? And well, it's obvious in Germany, we would not have car manufacturing today if it wasn't for industrial robots. Okay, 150 micrometers accurate, and they do precisely what you saw in the previous years, years video. And even worse, well, even when you look at the other two most common robots, that is the vacuum robot and the lawnmower robot, well, the lawnmower typically follows a wire in the grass um, or has a wire surrounding the grass, has an only bumps of it. And so it clearly is, um, well, adapted to the environment. Anybody who ever bought a Roomba knows the first thing you do when you act with the Roomba is you rearrange all your furniture so that its stochastic policy can randomly bump into your whole home. So what did we, what did, did we do? Well, we typically adapt our task completely to the robots. And when I got started in robotics as an, actually got started really early into robotics as an undergraduate student. And um, back then, the first thing you would hear from well, any classic roboticist, so I worked at DLR as an undergraduate student, DLR is, is Europe's biggest center for robotics, about the size of CMU's Robot Institute. And the one thing you always would hear from these classical robotics guys is we will never need learning in any form. So what will they what did they tell us? Well, they told me our analytical robotics approach solves everything. And the worldview was very simple. Well, analytical robotics needs three components. Well, we need an accurate simulator, so an accurate forward model. And with this accurate forward model, still, well, we can solve, uh, well, obviously everything. And well, unfortunately, it's somewhat wrong, right? I mean, it's a great prior. Physical principles yield fantastic simulators, but all models are wrong and well, only some are useful. And there's a ton of stuff in robotics which can be easily modeled, called, uh, for example, friction, actuated dynamics, contact, uh, um, and well, obviously lots of unforeseeable things. The second thing they being, well, basically pushed forward as the absolute necessary was planning algorithms. Now that obviously he runs into tons of problems. If you're just trying to do classical motion planning, while well, you run into exponential explosions, um, replanning online in real time becomes hard. And even worse, you have an optimization bias, which can easily break your robot if you have just a small well, mismatch between your model and your real system. And the last part is, well, fast feedback control, which we all know works super, super well, right? It's an error killer, but it also required that we build the best bodies for control. And up to today, nearly any robot you can buy is in the end built to be, well, controllable by, by the, well, easiest available methods. And therefore, well, has been too stiff, too power hungry, and very frequently had a too complex. <laughs> Somebody has a microphone on? Okay. I hope this wasn't my computer. I um, fixed it. And so we need to be clearly, well, I thought these were good arguments already back then, and I pushed road learning a lot. And as you guys know, well, the world has changed. Now everybody believes in learning, thanks to deep learning. And um, unfortunately, we've gone to the opposite extreme. End-to-end -end deep learning needs, well, just a flexible representation, a deep neural network. It just needs lots of data. And well, in the end, it just needs lots of computation. But unfortunately, well, if you can learn anything, you can also learn physically implausible things. So this is something any grad student trying to learn and on a real robot will notice very, very early. It's incredibly easy to learn a solution where the policy believes, oh, here's an energy bump, energy pump, and it has found some mismatch and some overgeneralization, and it directly tries to do a movement, well, which becomes 
unstable and breaks the rule. And even worse, when you do things where you have, you have learned a model, for example, well, you will even run into more optimization biases because now your models are unstructured and um, well, even smaller errors can cause really huge optimization biases. And finally, you're even losing the few guarantees which we got in classical robotics, statistics, and analytical robotics, since you have, well, the black box policy with very typically very little insight into the solution. And loads of data is, of course, something, well, which we cannot always promise is in robotics, since, well, robots live in the real world, few episodes are available, while at the same time, you get a lot of actions really, really fast, just well, the, the state action stream is in most parts meaningless, so you can't actually crunch it in any useful way. And real world obviously means real damages. Anybody who hasn't broken their robot in, the, uh, in their life, well, should not be given a robotics PhD um, since well, it is typically the first thing which happens. And the bad excuse we always come up with is, oh, well, you, um, if you can't work, can't get the data from the robot, why don't we use the physics simulator as a data generator? But in the end, that is just back to square one. Why would we need learning in the first place um, if our physics simulator is already so good that we can use it as data generator? Since in that case, we can also just directly do planning on the simulator. And finally, even then loads of computation is should be something which, well, we shouldn't be happy with in robotics since we would like to have online learning, obviously, but even worse, what do we do if the robot can't actually, well, has to move? And well, in this case, you need to store your computation. That means also the energy to, to get the, compu the, the computation, or you need to communicate, and in which case you may be just handicapped by communication problems. So, I'm seeing a major problem here since we basically have two extremes. And both of these are to some extent uh, come with a lot of problems. And I obviously don't have a solution here, but I can at least tell you about the lessons that I have learned. Since how should robot learning be different? Well, ideally you should try to do as much learning as you can on the real system. You should try to adapt with as little replanning as, as online, with as little replanning as possible, avoiding the real time bottleneck of, well, having, having a lot of real time data, but at the same time not being able to get meaningful data because you have so few episodes you know, it's, it's crucial. You want to be at least uh, partially explainable and be, well, ideally physically plausible and be capable of coping well if you use simulations to cope with the simulation optimization bias. And finally, if robot learning should ever work, well, we need to get away from having the best bodies you can build and not the best bodies for classical feedback control. Now, I obviously don't have the answers to you for, for all of these, um, these core insights, but at least I have some good um, lessons that I can tell. So what are my resulting research questions today? Well, I only focus on some of them, of these problems. Well, first I will be talking about how we can learn on a real system from little data. Then a little bit of how we can learn comprehensible modular policies. A little bit on, well, how we can learn physically plausible deep learning models. And finally, and, and how we can build the best bodies and still learn on real systems. And that will be accompanied by a conclusion and an argument. So we already, when, whenever we start learning, we typically start with an imitation. And um, well, since imitation is in the end, something we get really cheaply, right? For a, a long-term task, we would like to imitate. And the idea in, within robot learning is of course really old. So whenever we have some distribution over states, you denoted by the states denoted by S, the distribution denoted by mu, and some policy e, e, A over the actions, and which is conditional distribution of actions given, denoted by A given, given S, 
Well, we would like to minimize that to our training data denoted by Q as much as possible. That was the first approach which for it actually dates back to Michian chambers. So meaning as much as to the 1960s where they already realized that, well, just maximizing the similarity to the policy to the training data gives you model-free behavior cloning. And um, well, but if you bring in, and it was really popularized by Claude Samet, but if you bring in more constraints, as we've, for example, done in the work of Peter Englert, you can actually make this program, well, very efficient. And it turns out to be the dual problem to, well, inverse reinforcement learning. However, if you can, if you want to make it effective and really understand what you're doing, and you really want to do the dual, do not try to attempt um, inverse reinforcement learning, but much rather try to solve the dual problem for minimal physics. And that typically yields a new class of parametric policies. So for example, if you take minimal physics of um, mini minimal physics of linear, linear mechanical systems, you obtain the dynamic systems motor primitives proposed by Stefan Schaar for point-to-point -point movements and rhythmic movements. You end up with much more complex scenarios in the moment where you allow the movement to be represented by a Gaussian process. And at the same time, you get an effectively solvable uh, learning problem. However, there's one thing you gotta be really careful. In the moment where you move to the dual, you get a good representation, but you actually typically get a harder problem. So already Putaman showed in this classical Markov decision problem um, that the dual to this linear problem you see, or uh, linear yeah, in the function space problem you see up there, is actually the, the, the dual, so inverse RL, is actually harder than the original uh, than the original problem. This does not happen when you bring in minimal physics because you have allowed for sufficiently many simplifications. Now I'll show you a few examples where this worked really well for us. Um, so the first one is a ball on a string. You see here this ball will bouncing, but the ball is on the on a string. That's why it's so fast. And we had actually not thought the scenario would work by imitation learning out of the box because our well, really good control engineer, Jens Koba, had originally done this by hand, uh, tried this by hand programming, and it did not work by no means as good as the solution learned by imitation learning. And in fact, you can use the same approach, now much more recent work, by, for example, um, um, for learning, well, perception adapted, the probabilistic movement primitives, and well, train a policy by just taking the robot by the hand, giving it a few successful demonstrations, and well, you already directly get uh, well, good representation of forehands all over the table. Now, we all know, of course, that imitation is never enough. Right? Otherwise, you would graduate with a PhD from primary school, and um, well, none of us would ever make it into grad school. And instead, we need lots of the well, self-improvement, and which is well, so painful in the exercises at university or in sports, and that typically requires that we have a very, very different objective. Since this objective here no longer includes a notion of data, it includes a notion to an to a notion directly to a reward, and this reward could be an arbitrary function. We, of course, can bring in again the same constraints on well, um, that you have proper uh, state transfer in terms of a, of a model, and we could actually formulate this again as, for example, a linear program, and we even have the directly again the, the dual problem. Much more frequently, we use we invoke Bellman's principle of optimality. The, but again, in here, in all of these parts, well, we see first of all the primal should be, uh, so the primal that's actually the, the primal is the dual problem at the bottom is much harder than the dual. And even worse, there is no um, actual notion of data in here. So we're actually not really dealing with the learning per se. Now, in reinforcement learning, we, quick, we frequently solve this by the 
phrasing than problems as functional approximation problems, but it doesn't actually come out of the notion of the original problem. It turned out that there was a very, very simple thing which we discovered for the first time back in 2002 and well, or 2003, which has subsequently been become a driving force in, in much more involved um, derivations then, that we would add actually the objective from behavioral cloning as a constraint to the original problem. So we would bound, um, we would bound the similarity of the policy to our training data or the previous policy by some epsilon. And well, we started really early with this. Today, pretty much any algorithm um, well, commonly used in, in deep learning actually makes use of this uh, insight in one form or the next, because you actually have a ton of things you can derive from this. So if you choose your queue the right way, so your distribution of, of, of data the right way, you can get an analytical solution for classical policy. You can get a mellow softmax approach. You can get all the entropy regulation or regularization approaches. You get natural policy gradients as the linearizations. And similarly, TRPO is an approximation. SAC is nothing but that you enter actually, well, a notion on uniformity on data in here. Yeah, in this case, you only have the entropy left. So most of the things which are around actually stem direct, directly, directly from this formulation. For us, this enabled already the, quite a while back that we would suddenly had algorithms which in, allowed us to, uh, well, learn policies efficiently. And well, this year is, um, it's just well, it's already a decade old, but this was a policy. This was in the end a policy matching algorithm, which learned within uh, back then 90 trials to become perfect at this ball in the cup task, uh, based on an imitation, and it became well after about 30 trials, 30 something trials, it would get the first ball into the cup, and it became perfect up after 90 trials. Now, what does this actually? Um, well, so, so in the end, this is better than any human being since none of us becomes actually perfect at this task. Yes. Um, and it is at the learning speed already back then, it was faster than, than a 12, 10 year old child and um, well, six year old children don't actually manage to learn this task even at all. So for us, there was a big, a big success. What was even more surprising though is if you take the same, well, exact, basically exactly the same in methods and use the most modern approaches, you actually can learn juggling within by now three shots. So you just basically needed, uh, um, every ball had to be shown three times to be in the cup for one-handed juggling in order to give you a behavior where the robot could juggle for 30 minutes in a one-armed sense. One arm juggling is actually quite hard um, for the humans who have tried of you have tried it. And so I next thing I asked Kai, who was um, the PhD student in that picture, I told him, well, why don't you, why don't you now go for two-handed juggling? And I didn't expect him to come back to me anytime soon with it. Well, next day I find this video in my inbox. And it actually turns out that there are motor primitive formulations we get today are well with these kind of with these kind of algorithms and this combination of both imitation learning and reinforcement learning is still the most effective method um, for learning tasks on real robots in well high speed scenarios from very very little data in the end since I mean this requ if it re sort of requires only three throws and three catches that is very, very level data in comparison to the millions you would need to train uh, well, a more complex representation. So the next obvious question is, well, if you can learn on a real system with well, little data, can we actually learn a more comprehensible policy? Something which is more than a black box. And from our perspective, this we should never forget in robotics, we have only two types of motion which we see. We, we see a motion which is either point-to-point -point movement 
and maybe with some blending or poor articulation in between, or we have a rhythmic task. And these can be phrased as primitives, which are then subsequently modulated by a supervisor. And well, a lot of knowledge can be generalized during execution, so you could actually learn these in the right space. And the selection, superposition, sequencing, and reparameterization, the adaptation of these primitives is actually really the core problem in order to make a robotics work on, well, in, in a modular fashion on more and more complex tasks. So we have spent, well, well, basically the most of the last 10 years at trying to understand of how can we learn, well, take, by learning single primitives, like the one for juggling you've seen for a rhythmic task there, or the one for ball bouncing on a string as you've seen, or in learned by imitation running, or the ball in the cup. How can we actually learn many such primitives at once and compose more complex behavior with them? And my PhD student, Rudy Lutikoff, focused on that. And he created something which we like to call a parser, which actually takes a long, traject long demonstration, ideally, or multiple long demonstrations if necessary, and segments them into many different primitives. Here illustrated in this colorful plot by well, primitives in red, green, blue, and yellow, and builds up a primitive library with an EM-like algorithm, and where a primitive typically becomes well, a physics-based representation, which gives you a distribution over possible trajectories. The trajectory is denoted by tau, and the parameters of the trajectory generator the, um, uh, the physics um, are denoted by beta. And Rudy applied this for a variety of problems, and one of them is, well, isolate directly isolating policies from um, imitation for well, robot table tennis, which include more than just forehands, but actually a variety of forehands and, um, and backhands. And this now requires, of course, that you have a two-layered approach, since you have a gating network, which activates different policies, and while well, you have the different policies. Now, how would you bring the previous problem, which I had just shown you, you um, and for reinforcement learning with such a modular policy? Well, let's have a quick look. This here is how the problem looked like in the primal, uh, as I had um, uh, as I had shown you before. And the naive approach, of course, is you just place well, the, na the name of the primitive. We call, let's, let's just call it O for option. And um, you place it, this additional variable into your policy. And well, you could do some factorization approaches um, or whatever you prefer, um, prefer. You do it as a mixture. Yeah, all of these, these things are possible. And well, we directly applied a, such approaches already quite a while back. And it turned out it actually is enough for learning table tennis. So here, actually, the, the selection of the primitive is typically done based on the movements of the opponent, even to a large extent, and only for refining in the last part, uh, it um, uses the ball trajectories. It's uh, the human, there's three cameras looking at the human, and there's four cameras looking at the ball. And well, basic table tennis can already be um, acquired in this form. However, when we move to just a simply slightly different problem of tether ball, where you had a ball on a string, this approach stopped working. We tried to understand it and my PhD student Christian Daniel actually figured out at, uh, well, why this doesn't, doesn't work. And there's a problem why it doesn't generalize from table tennis to tether ball. The tether ball is just basically a ball on a string thing, and there is a big hole in the middle. And it turns out that the problem with this um, naive transfer is that the, that the sub policies don't necessarily specialize. And in fact, we see the same problem um, with frequently also with the deep learned um, policies. Piece. Um, now, for that reason, he suggested that we should actually force our primitives to only have a limited uh, responsibility so that they specialize better. 
And um, that can be accomplished by just um, enforcing that there's limited information stored in the gating decision on the choice of the parameters. And here you see a simple sample run. It also enables us now to do much smarter choices in both in terms of performance. So even for table tennis, but especially for tetherball, um, it allowed us to obtain well, better performance faster and also better final performance. While at the same time, it gave us a principled way to reduce the number of primitives employed. And therefore, in, you know, even before we had ways of cutting out primitives which would never be used, but this actually allowed us to actively eliminate the primitives. And there's been a variety of small manipulation problems like stacking blocks to build a high tower or doing a peppermint task, mill task or um, well, cutting an act plant in bimanual manipulation which was which we did using this approach. Now let's next focus on the next subproblem, the subproblem of execution. And this is actually a great domain for deep learning, surprisingly so, since um, in execution, well, you really want to share knowledge across many tasks. So if you want to accomplish a very different primitive in a very different scenario, you would ideally want to still use uh, the execution. However, that also means that we suddenly have to do something for which, well, deep learning wasn't designed for, since we have to learn physically plausible solutions using deep models. And here we are really going into the domain of model learning, and models are really crucial for all kinds of executional robotics. So there's inverse models, which we need for, which are typically used in an accurate uh, control. There's energy models, which are typically the only way to give you your, well, easily give you trajectories in underactuated tasks um, from, well, first order principle and even give you control loss for that uh, without you having to solve a very complex addition problem. And finally, there's obviously forward models, which is basically, well, learning a simulator. And in classically, if you talk to a roboticist, the only way to get it really right is to do model engineering, which um, well, in classical robotics really means take your robot apart, put it into many little pieces. Uh, and once you have the many little pieces, is then, well, figure out the center of gravity, mass, inertia. Um, and then once you have the pieces, you really get an accurate model of nearly everything, right? Friction not, actuated dynamics not, there you have to do a little bit more, but uh, by potentially system identification, but um, you actually get masses and inertia, right? System identification, which you all learn in control engineering classes, actually turns out to be a nightmare if you wanna do it on a real robot. In fact, um, most people who do this for robot manufacturers have always told me they, take the cat data and they rather put a constraint on it than solve the original system identification problem in the way it's done in the, text, in the textbook uh, uh, and constrain it to be close to that solution before they would actually ever put a system identification based solution into um, any commercially available robot. So you can hear this from KUKA, you can hear this from ABB, um, you can also hear this within, within DLR. Now, in system identification, the textbook solution is, well, robotics is linear in the parameters. So therefore, we actually have a least squares problem, and we could just compute the solution. The only problem is these basis functions are unfortunately redundant, and the solutions you can obtain for the parameters are non-unique. So it's a non-convex problem in the end due to the redundancies is in the basis functions. And even worse, the physical meaning totally gets lost when you move it from the rigid body the model to um, the problem linear and the parameters. So you suddenly have to ensure that, well, you still have, you're not violating the parallel axis theorem, your inertia tensors are always positive definite, and um, a ton of other uh, constraints. So 
it also comes with a huge share of problems. And obviously, a pure black box learning approach, which just uses, for example, a deep neural network as a function and F, well, that would um, comes with its own share of nightmares. Even worse, it doesn't, it, there's not, it wasn't even, it isn't even clear whether you could even learn an energy model from using a pure black box approach. Now, Michael and I, we had this idea of, well, why don't we bring in, in the ideas from Lagrangian physics and from Lagrangian mechanics and place these right into the model representation where we would still use a deep neural network in order to um, obtain the basic representation needed for example, for potential energy and kinetic energy, but then use it in such a way that, well, the um, form is always guaranteed to be in the, uh, the, the system is always guaranteed to be in the right form and that we can directly train all three kinds of models at once. So the energy model, the forward model, and the inverse model. And well, we call this DLAN um, of uh, deep Lagrangian neural networks. And the parameter optimization is actually that each of these three different models gives you an additional loss, which well can um, be helpful for obtaining a higher performance. And it turns out that you can actually, well, learn, for example, here, the forces of a two degrees of freedom robot. You can actually predict these really well and the, the, yeah, the simulated example. And addition, well, it generalizes really, really well to control of simple systems. So what you see here is the analytical model first on the left for a uh, for rotor pendulum. Then you see the um, system identification solution, which is obtained online in real time and extended online in real time. And you notice it never gets to um, an upright position. It never gets a model which actually is accurate enough. While on the far right, you see the DLAN solution, which well, manages to obtain the model while at the same time in learning to uh, balance the pole and swing it up and balance the pole within actually a really short amount of time. Even more important, oops, sorry, I just wanted to turn this. So you can actually learn accurate feed forward control in a physically plausible way. And it even turns out with the up enough stability guarantee um, on, on uh, well, the Barrett Wham robot, so this is, set, is a, we have a seven degrees of freedom, high, high speed Barrett Wham. I believe actually it's only us in U Tokyo and MIT who still have a high speed Barrett Wham, which works. And um, well, that can really, that getting high performance uh, trajectories and high accuracy out of it is actually not that straightforward with the manufacturer's model. It turned out that DLAN worked really well. Now, let me get to the last part. And um, why do we actually want, uh, one key reason why we should learn, should want robot learning is actually such that we can build the best bodies and learn on real systems. Um, instead of, um, well, not, um, instead of finding systems, which a classical control engineering approach can handle much better than anything we can do with robot learning. And we set out to that actually also already um, well, a long time ago. And finally, well, the robot now has actually pretty nice performance. And well, here we really would like to see that well, we're getting away from the idea of classical robotics that we build the best uh, body for feature control. When you look at humans by comparison. Right? None of these, none of these videos, we can easily match with the current robot, at least not for the versatility seen here. And the amazing thing we have for human bodies is that while well, we reach high velocities and we perform very skillful motions at the same time, we do this without breaking. So we really have bodies which are suited for learning, but we also our control approaches, um, well, there are 
clearly not what um, clearly not designed for just feedback control. So we well we set out to build the best body we can build, and that obviously requires that we have something muscle like, so a very strong actuator actually, um, and at the same time small moving masses. So again, put into perspective how if how um, a buried wham the wrist of a buried wham is two kilogram. Um, the whole human arm is actually less than two kilograms. And we would like to, of course, see a robot arm to be even less. So small moving masses of 700 gram is a really essential to us. And additionally to that, well, we want a variable stiffness, which can, for example, be accomplished by antagonistic actuation. And we want to have it in such a way that already the mechanics prevent, well, damages to the robot and enable compliance. So with other words, we want to build performance and for learning, since we really want to really want to allow the system to learn without intervention and um, not um, or really not build the body for feedback control. And the resulting body, the resulting robot is actually, well, quite fast. Um, so the accelerations are 10 times of what um, you get in, in safe operation, they're already 10 times of what you get out of the buried women safe, safe operation. And the speed is at least three times of what you can get out of a buried women safe operation. Now we, I've taken a buried women to, to more than that, by that um, but also we could take our robot to the more than that. So next thing I, well, I happened to, I happened to tell my PhD student about well, me training a robot to do T-ball during my PhD and having to put a ball onto well, the stick in T-ball more than several thousand times and how nice it would have been to just, well, leave the room and let the robot train instead of sitting there uh, uh, well, during an execution on the emergency off and then putting the ball back on. And he created the really, a really, really cool setup um, and training on a simulated ball. And um, well, what did he do? He first took a simulate, he took priorly recorded the trajectories of a simulated ball, uh, of a real ball, and used them, as, used them up to the point where the robot hits or doesn't hit the simulated ball for, for training, and then just extrapolates the rest. And he gives the, he trains the real robot on that. So you obviously on the screen, you see the simulated ball with the, well, in, with the um, visualization of the real robot, which you see at the same time on the right. And then he just simply left the room and he didn't come back. He, he actually made a point out of not coming back of um, staying out of the room for, well, all the first one hour, two hours, and as you will see in a moment, well, this, this probably should have sped up. After 14 hours, you actually see um, some very directed high-speed movement and a high acceleration movement, and um, which where it reliably hits back all the well, replayed um, real ball trajectories in the well, simulated in the well, as simulated balls, and you, we move directly on to playing on uh, playing against real balls. Here, another little bit of training was needed um, since well, in order to get the ball right. But I think these are among the most skillful table tennis hits which I've seen a robot perform so far. So you may notice it even cuts um, the ball um, to some extent. And um, well, it shows you we should really build the right bodies um, if we want to do robot land. So that brings me to the conclusion. I've luckily stayed on time. Um, so let me just go once back to the lessons. I think we have hoped to have made clear. We really got to learn on the real system. But we only have three paths of doing that, which you can actually put together in arbitrary combinations. So if you can start with an imitation, then go for reinforcement learning, then you will be able to learn on the real system. If you really must do things um, with a model, 
well, for model based RL, well, then we, you really got to find safe model learning methods, um, since otherwise it's just going to be, well, too dangerous. Because, um, unless you build the right body, so a body really for learning from scratch. You should always try to do, well, online learning without replanning. And for that, you need, well, such perception modulated movement primitives as, as we have used in the first part of the talk which luckily also then give you some form of, of modularity, smart data reuse, and um, the basic tools to avoid the real-time bottleneck and to cope with a little episodic data problem. If you want to be at least partially explainable, you should actually read Rudy Ludikov's second paper, where he uses his parser to then also create um, automata and well, near lingual descriptions of the acquired tasks. And well, try to be physically plausible. Can you do model learning and use DLAN? And I, oh, I left that one out, but we actually have ways to bound the simulation optimization bias, so the bias arising from training in a model on a, on a simulator. And for that, you may want to use um, an approach called SCOTA. And finally, don't build the best bodies for feedback controls, but build the best bodies. And that requires small moving masses antagonistic variable stiffness actuation and robot learning. Robot learning is really at the center of what we do, but we do loads more in terms of robot, robot engineering, whether for table tennis, uh, learning control for table tennis, technical skill libraries, is our well, proofs of stability. Um, we develop way more in terms of learning methods so even learning methods that enable us to learn well abstract strategies independent from task domains so to transfer things from basic puzzle games to to actual robot manipulation we work on well new approaches to to optimal control by approximate inference much more reinforcement learning and well, um, even some benefit stuff. And finally, we're interested in why we humans with our, well, how to put this, terrible computing hardware, right? Our computing hardware is super noisy, are so incredibly good at uh, movement. And for that, we really try to understand, well, why, how humans accomplish all of these amazing treats and how that we can explain, use our approaches to and merge them either for spiking neural models, those um, in order to, um, to ground um, in some human ins cognitive science insight into robotics or to actually use our methods to explain conundrums like human ball catching in baseball while using reinforcement learning. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, well hope you have lots of questions thank you so much jan i think this was very inspiring on multiple levels not just algorithms but i think you clearly have worked on so many of the interesting robots i think we have a first question from florian florian go ahead unmute yourself yes thanks for the great talk jan um so I, I was I was wondering about the deep Lagrangian uh, models. Uh, would it be able to handle contacts as well? So there was one thing which uh, my PhD student had started working on until he uh, decided to oh, turn this on off. Uh, um, and until he decided to that he wanted to get more into control. Um, I believe there was an internship with animesh involved <laughs> um since that would have been the natural next step to to fully get in to fully use this with contacts now contacts bring in an interesting component actually since um i mean if, if you do contacts right they should only be absorbing energy they should not actually creating energy unless there is they're actuated and so I think this is a huge, a huge challenge involved, in, but I think it's it's one of the most important things um, to do next year. So uh, yeah, I got to wait for the next PhD student to do that, sadly. Um, <laughs> got it, got it. But I, I guess my question is, would you incorporate it as a constraint in the existing system or would you completely change the approach? I would actually include, I mean, constraint, 
constraints are interesting, right? When you do, do, especially when you do model learning, because your data in theory should already fulfill them. Um, now, if they don't, if they don't come with the regularity, the, then they're not useful, right, for learning. So you just basically have to hope your data system fits them well, and if it doesn't, it doesn't harm you so badly. So if um, if constraints were just some re typical regularity and not, um, they don't come with well, like let's say the passivity component, then you actually don't need to extend anything. But I think in the moment where you want to do this right, you may want to you want to bring in first of all the passivity of uh, the system, and I think this brings you another lost term, um, which um, yeah is definitely going to be interesting. And the other component which will be interesting in this context is also of course that the change of differential equation which you have when you use this model changes. So you're suddenly with the stiff differential equations most frequently at least. And um, so when you want to expand on long-term behavior, you, you, uh, you should get a lot of, of new challenges as well. Um, for sure, for inverse, inverse dynamics models, that probably doesn't matter. But obviously, when you, do, when you do forward model learning, that matters a lot. That's great. Thank you. So for Wonderful. inverse dynamics models, is actually, yeah, um, it will go most natural to the transfer. Are there other questions? Feel free, audience, uh, to type in or raise your hand. While we wait for an audience question, I have a question, which is more technical. In the initial part of the talk, you basically showed that you can start with imitation learning, then you can do model-based behavior cloning, and that problem formulation is kind of, uh, let's say, the dual of inverse RL, but you can also reformulate this as a functional sort of optimization problem that you mentioned as well. Now, in optimization, often, as you said also, um, the trick is which of the variations of problem specification is easier to solve. Uh, do you have insight on when would model-based behavior cloning be be better versus, uh, let's say, solving a forward RL problem or even just like an RL version of the problem? The reason why I ask this question in particular is latest results are in line with this sort of argument, which is very surprising, by the way, to show that yeah. if you have reasonably large data with enough noise in the data, it is very mm -hmm. hard to uh, to beat behavior cloning based algorithms. Uh, yes. Yes, go ahead. No, I, I think actually it's, it's, it is probably the case when you um, when you have to deal, well, if, you have, if you're dealing with a discretized version, for example, or a function space version, um, so something which employs kernels in there, um, and you don't have anything on any additional, how to call this, inductive bias coming from your physics, from the physics of your system. Um, it will always be the case that model-based behavioral cloning will uh, beat um, inverse RL. Um, the thing is just that most of the times we, well, frequently we, we have, first of all, the whole infrastructure so well together for inverse RL. That helps the whole inverse RL story, the, um, that we have a much better human understanding for the value of functions. That helps us with the inverse RL. But I actually think that from, from a mathematical point of view, model-based behavior cloning should be superior if you don't put in additional prior knowledge. And uh, whether that is in our case for the when we put in movement primitives, this, the prior knowledge is that we use a minimal physical system that can still represent the task. Um, in the case of well, of most inverse reinforcement learning algorithms. Um, the problem here is that, well, we have smart grad students. We know how to teach us to use and uh, how to tune algorithms. So, um, so on that note, I have a follow-up question because we're waiting for our audience, but I think this is, a, this is an open-ended question and I believe this would be the last question is, so you have done a lot of the work over the last two decades and I'm personally a fan of a lot of this line of work, but a lot of it is focused on generating what you would say robot state trajectories, right? We are doing learning directly in the space of controls and trying to predict directly in the space of controls. Uh, however, even the video that you're showing, this this cool robot pouring video that you, you have up right now, 
one could argue a lot of this generalization problem is because of our perceptual understanding of the world. For example, the small cup, the small container, or the large cup, large container, it's not just a control problem, it's also understanding the perceptual representations of the world. Uh, where do you think are the next, let's say, and I'm asking this on behalf of all my PhD students, uh, <laughs> what are the next five years of challenges in robot learning? Do you think it's perception? Do you think it's still control or it's a combination of those? Uh, deep learning is really good at perception, perceptual representations. Yep. It's only making new breakthroughs in control slowly. Uh, so what, what is your sort of thoughts? What is your advice to, to five years of PhD students? I mean, this is, this, is, this is a really big question. I mean, first of all, I, 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 the, for us humans, action and perception are not so different, right? Um, so what we perceive is actually an action. Um, from at least from what I understand from all my time with the cognitive scientists. And so for us humans, many of these things are, are not, you can't e actually differ so easily with them, between them. I think for a PhD student, I mean, the, the really big problem with the, all the perception tasks is that, well, you, you need to collect the data. Um, now, in the moment where you, as long as you do this, as long as somebody else does this for you, whether that is, um, I mean, DeepMind hires actually people over the internet who joystick their robots. Um, now, typical PhD student can't afford that. Um, so clearly not a choice. So, but on the other hand, we humans don't need this either, right? I mean, we can learn tasks relatively fast. So focusing on, um, Focusing on little data learning is, I think, still the, in the best niche for PhD students. And bringing in, um, well, bringing in better prior from the successes in, in perception may actually be very useful. So to, to, to directly, for example, so my, one idea from cognitive science, which for example, has been underused uh, so far in robotics, is that it, they believe we actually do um planning in planning in the same space as you do perception um and that can be a higher dimensional space it's not even clear whether that's a, it actually you know it's likely to be a higher dimensional space is then the space of our perceptions i mean that has to do of course with our human hardware and our eyes are unfortunately not megapixel cameras but it's actually a tiny spot which saccades around in order to, to take um, a couple of shots and then interpolates the picture. Um, so it's, um, it's a very, very different situation from, um, so most of, most of what you actually currently see is imagined and filled in by your brain, in including much of your depth perception even. Um, since that, that's one of the reasons why you can close one eye and still see in 3D. Um, this is literally, it's literally we are spanning into bigger representation and then we do our action planning in it. Figuring out how to have this um, scenario invertible and bringing in actions in there, I think that could be a really valuable thing. Um, another thing which I think would be really valuable that's, that goes beyond, it's actually not so close to perception, but um, so we made first roads into um, the SPOTA, which is the, uh, well, that's the way to bound the simulation optimization biases. There's more than just the bias you could bound in uh, the, the direct simulation optimization bias. So figuring out it, how to um, how to get better guarantees is actually will be because actions can destroy things. Um, bringing them together with perception will, is actually more prone to destroy things. So to create things which um, which give you have at least some basic guarantee is actually also going to be crucial, especially when once you get to applications. I mean, at some point, I still dream that um, you can that we finally can have a robot surgeon that doesn't require a human operator. Uh, in which uh, the best human surgeon can train. Now, you can't do this without guarantees. Um, you can't, even the corona, you know, the simple stick in the nose corona test. I mean, how, how useful would have been a robot for that? 
but um, even 10 operated, I would have thought three times before I allow them to stick one of these tests in my nose, uh, one of the sticks for the test in my nose. Um, I'm pretty sure none of you would have risked it either. <laughs> so I think we need. I think we need to get closer to guarantees there, but we also need to move away from the idea that um, the way we humans perceive our own vision will be so helpful. I think we need to move more towards um, tactile understanding of the world, which gives us frequently something like, which is closer to switches um, than to continuous estimates and therefore should enable easier learning problems and learning problems where you can make real uh, um, yeah, real um, progress. Wonderful. Uh, first of all, thank you for answering such an open-ended question. Uh, I think I would like to thank Jan again for a wonderful uh, talk, a lot of insights and questions. And I would like to thank all of the audience as well for sticking around. Thanks again. I'm going to stop recording.